Hey, this is Dominic, and this is your home for the cutting edge conversations on optimizing your personal performance, lighting up your sex life, and living a purpose driven life of your own design. These are the topics that Dominic and I have both struggled with in our own lives and still don't always get right. This is Brian. Welcome to the Great Man Podcast. You all are in for a big old treat today because after about 230 episodes, we are finally turning the spotlight on our brother that everyone loves, my co-pilot and partner in crime, Brian Stacy. You know, one year ago, Brian hit absolute rock bottom. I'd never seen him go to such a deep and dark emotional place in the entirety of knowing him. And for good reason, he had just dissolved his baby a tech startup company that he invested the last three or four years into all of his financial assets, also a bruised ego and a growing inner narrative that told him he was a failure. And this was going on all at the same time that the world was entering lockdown for a mysterious and scary global pandemic. Fast forward less than one year later, and Brian has built a new company from scratch, which caught fire securing marquee clients like HBO, Netflix, and Dancing with the Stars, he was able to obliterate this inner narrative of, I'm a failure. In fact, he's a runaway success. And by the way, that's just the business side of things. Brian's got two more surprises to reveal to you, our audience, that he can't wait to share that he's even more excited about than the success of his business. But I'll let him be the one to break those stories to you. It's been said, that the darkest hour is just before dawn. And Brian's story is the very epitome of that lesson. But that lesson is all too easy to forget when you are enveloped by that darkness. Brian's story today is meant to be in service to you, whether you find yourself in that darkness now or at some point in the future, as you look to turn any of life's adversities into triumphs. So in this episode today, we will talk about how your identity Your self-concept is the make or break factor in how you handle adversity, how to build the muscle to roll with the punches that life will inevitably throw at you that you didn't expect or you don't desire, why only making decisions from your mind is like playing your life with a half deck, and why only making reasonable, logical, and practical decisions leads to one hell of a boring life. I know you'll enjoy today's episode on Turning Adversity into Triumph, featuring our boy, Brian Stacy. Buddy, you have some news that is no doubt going to thrill at least like 90% of our audience and the other 10% who have some sort of romantic fantasy with you are going to be devastated by this news. Brother, drop the bomb on us. What do you got? I'm excited about this. Last weekend, I proposed to Becca. She actually said, I will. But it means yes. It means yes. So we are, we're engaged. Dude, I got to tell you, I always thought this moment in my life would feel like an ending. And maybe this is just a skewed view on marriage, like what I thought relationships were. But I loved being single. And I loved that aspect of my life. I liked dating around. I loved going on the dating apps. Like I liked all that stuff. And so I always knew inevitably, right, you're supposed to get married and blah, 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 all the things that, that were told. And so I knew I, I would probably go down that route at some point. And there was this feeling of like, this is going to be an ending. Like I've been on the hunt my entire life and now it's over yeah, and done with. I think what made this feel so obvious to me is that in this relationship with Becca, I feel a greater sense of freedom. And that is different than any other relationship that I've had before. And so this doesn't feel like an ending, like I thought it was going to feel, but this feels like a, a, like a really new, a really exciting beginning of something. And man, like that feels amazing. Which is, I can relate to so much of that and the way that the two of you have shown up in your relationship and the engagement, which I had to a front row seat at, because we're going to talk about the story of, of this magical day you created for Becca and the rest of us who are super close to you. It's very clear that this is a beginning, like a kind of a, a gun going off, you know, and there's now this like new race that you two are running. And it was beautiful to witness. 
you have to have to share the story about this incredible engagement because it was a surprise that you laid out for Becca and you nailed it with a little bit of divine intervention from the gods. Okay. So tell the story, man. This one's, this one's one for the ages. Some things you can plan, Dominic, and other things just happen. Back up here a little bit. As I started to go down the path of what should a ring look like and where do I want to propose and start formulating these ideas in my head, as you know, Dominic, we live right next to the Williamsburg Bridge, and then right out in front of our place is Domino Park. And that bridge has been so iconic in our life. It's literally, that bridge is my favorite place in New York City. Even before Beck and I were together, before we lived here, I used to love riding my bike across that bridge and looking south and seeing Statue of Liberty in Brooklyn and Lower Manhattan and looking north and seeing Midtown and like the iconicness of New York. It's just a, it's a spectacular place. And so I, I thought that the bridge would be a perfect place to do this proposal, but I wanted to do it in a cool place. And there's this little alcove that isn't really accessible by the public, but it looks like a balcony that overlooks the river looking north. And I pointed at that spot. I'm like, that's the spot. That's where I'm going to propose. And I'm going to plan the entire day around that bridge. So I've got this entire plan, which we'll talk about here in a moment. And then about three weeks prior to this engagement happening, they threw up this white tarp all around that balcony <laughs> area and started doing construction on it. <laughs> That's the first sign that this thing was not going to go off like like without a hitch. That's exactly it's exactly <laughs> it. I was like, I'm going to talk to City Hall. I'm going to talk to the construction workers. Like, I'm going to get on that balcony. I had the cops involved. They were going to give us an escort to that location to like drop her off, and I was going to meet her there on the balcony. I'm like, this is going to be spectacular. And then I wasn't deterred by the, the white tarp going up. What I was deterred by was three days now prior to the engagement, they actually started construction on it and they had put tubes in there because there were toxic fumes <laughs> coming out of this area now that they had quarantined off. And I was like, okay, let's read the, let's read the tea leaves here and, and come up with something different. Yeah. So that's where this story begins. I wanted Becca to feel taken care of. I wanted her to feel a sense of, I know what's going on. Like, I'm probably going to be a proposal, but how it's going to go down, how it's going to unfold is going to be mysterious. And so when this whole thing changed, I had to make new plans. So here's what I knew at this point in time. I knew that I was going to propose. <laughs> I knew that there was going to be some sort of smoke screen prior to. Metaphorical smoke screen, not literal exposing right. to toxic right. fumes smoke screen. That's <laughs> right. Right. Not to be confused. <laughs> okay. And I knew I was going to, I wanted our, our like really close friends and family physically here if possible. And if, if not virtually. Um, so those are the things that I knew. What I didn't know was how the actual proposal was going to go down because now that, that balcony idea was out the window. So with three days prior to the engagement, uh, with the help of my buddy, Nishant Roy, we found a sailboat and we chartered the sailboat. And so the idea was the plan for the day was I was going to make Becca coffee like I do every single morning. I told her that I had planned an explore New York day. It started with us walking across the Williamsburg Bridge, going to get brunch at Bubby's. Yeah, great spot. And then I was going to take her on – I love Bubby's. And then I was going to take her on, on this thing. She didn't know about the boat, but we're going to take her on this boat. This boat now – the reason we decided to do a boat is because at this at our rooftop on our party, we had a drone pilot. Yeah. Can we talk about this drone for a second? So for those of us who are like, there, there were about 35 of us and Brian will get to this part of the story, sitting on top of a Brian's rooftop balcony overlooking the Williamsburg Bridge because we were a part of this whole surprise. There was a drone that was capturing incredible footage of all this, including the bridge. Is it legal to have a drone in New York City especially that close to a bridge. Like I thought that that shit was going to get shot down out of the sky. Yeah, I don't think so. I don't think it's legal, <laughs> but I, I, that was one of those when I was talking to the drone pilot, I asked him that question and he just kind of mumbled something. He's like, meh, 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 meh. I asked him the same question and his words to me were, I'm not answering that question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I like to live in, live in, in this case, ignorance is bliss. Yep. So I, I think it's illegal, but he seemed to not mind. Okay, okay. He did tell me, though, he said, listen, if this thing gets shot down or we lose it, you have to pay for it. And I said, that's an acceptable risk. I'll take Fair. that. Okay. Yeah. So the idea was that this boat trip was going to culminate in being right outside of our apartment so everybody on the rooftop could see it all happen. I was going to get on the bow of the boat, take a knee. The drone was going to be taking shots. I had a photographer on the boat and everybody was going to be screaming from the balcony. So that was 
the vision. Yep. And there's a big sign that said like, say yes, up on the balcony. Yeah, so there's, there's a big sign yeah. in case she wasn't sure what to say. <laughs> then there's a big sign that said it. Subtle hints. So we get on the boat. The day is going great. We walk across the William Birds Bridge. Bubby's was amazing. We get to the boat. The captain's great. And we're coming around the tip of Manhattan and we're heading up the East River towards that spot near Domino Park in our apartment. And we are about 500 feet so close. away from the location. Yeah, so, close. so close. The boat stops. And I thought he was just buying time because we had to be there at specifically at 2.30. I thought he was just buying time. So we sat there on the bow of the boat for about 10 minutes. And I'm like, what is going on? So I go to the back of the boat. And I was like, hey, Captain, we're ready to go. Like, let's, let's move this thing along. And he said, just so you know, I'm dealing with a problem right now. And he was, he was flustered. I said, well, what, what kind of problem? He's like, it's a big problem. And he said, why don't you grab a seat? Becca's still on the bow. And so I said, well, is she safe out there? Like, <laughs> should I bring her back? And he's like, yes, bring her back. And so I don't know what's going on at this point. So I'm like, Becca, come on back here. She sits down and he goes, put on the BDs, the buoyancy devices. So he put on these gigantic life vests and we still don't know what's going on. And he goes, Brian, take the helm. <laughs> and so here I am with this giant sailboat wheel, not a clue in the world what I'm doing. I was going to say, what the hell do you know about it? To do- Nothing. Okay. I don't know. He goes, keep it pointed in this direction. I'm like, I don't. Uh, okay. I assume it's like a car. Wait, let's, just, let's just go was it, was it actually one of those big wheels that you see on like ships and yes. movies? It was actually one of those things? It was, it was a metal. It was a metal one. I, but yes, yeah, so it was a pretty good size wheel. Yeah. So all of a sudden he goes to the bottom of the boat, comes out with a radio and he's like, Psh, Coast Guard, Coast Guard, this is Julia. We're dead in the water. Engines are out. Like, we need help. <laughs> and so this is the first news to me that, like, well, the engine's out. Like, this sucks. Quick question for you. I don't know anything about boats, but my assumption was that sailboats don't need engines. What's going on with this boat? <laughs> right. Sailboat sail. I don't know much either, Dominic, but that, that seems like a logical assumption. And I don't know if it was due to the winds or the currents or whatever it was, but the captain was flustered. My, my theory is that the captain didn't know how to do a sailboat to sail a sailboat <laughs> okay i think he's just like we're gonna run the motor today we're gonna be all good and then when the motor went out like it was either paddles or towing motor so. goes out okay so the motor is out your plans so in the jeopardy motor's out yeah and then now i'm thinking I'm like how is this going to unfold so the the coast guard now and and god bless them they were there within five minutes they pull it alongside and they're like, hey, what's going on? And he's like, the motor's dead. They're like, how well do you feel? Do you feel comfortable traversing with the sail? He said, no, I need a tow. And then I looked at him and I'm, I'm, I'm signaling to him like, dude, like we need to get to that spot. Like, people can't see us. We're like, the bridge is between us and you guys on the rooftop now. Like we're now 800 feet away. We're going the wrong direction. I'm like, well, somehow we need to get to this spot. So he's looking at me and he's like, could you tow us five minutes up north a little bit? And they're like, what? We don't understand. <laughs> Then he blurts out, like it wasn't quiet. He blurts out, he goes, I'm trying to finish a marriage proposal right now. <laughs> so Beck is sitting next to me and she looks at me, she's like, what? <laughs> What's going through your head as this guy completely blows your surprise? I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> like this is, you had one job. <laughs> it was to keep a secret. Like, come on, man. But he listen, he was he was he was flustered. I think he was worried that that he was gonna run into the rocks and couldn't control his boat. And so at that point, all I could do was laugh. And Becca thought it was hilarious. She's like, he totally blew up your spot. This is very funny. He came back and apologized. And then the question in my mind, now I'm an extrovert. That's why I love doing podcasts, because this is my moment to process everything that's going on in my life. So I appreciate I appreciate the mic here. So I'm now processing out loud, like extroverts do, about what I should do next. Yeah. So I look at Becca. I'm like, is now the right time? It feels strange because now we have six Coast Guard people. Yeah. Four. Now, the second boat came. The, the New York Fire Department had to come because the Coast Guard boat was too small to tow us. So now we've got like 10 guys there plus the captain. I'm like, isn't that it's a chaos? They're trying to hook the boats up together. And I'm trying to figure out, do I still propose right now? <laughs> like we're not in the right spot. I don't know if we're ever going to get to the right spot. And so I'm processing out loud and she's looking at me. She's like, I don't, do you want to? I don't know. <laughs> and so I finally reached the conclusion. I'm like, you know what? We're doing it right in the middle of the chaos, right in the middle of like 10 guys rolling around that, that by the way, did not give a shit what we were doing. Seriously? They were just doing their thing. Oh, they, they were either clueless or didn't give a shit. One of the so two. So you drop to a knee and like everyone's BAU, like just business as usual doing their stuff around you. Completely, completely business as usual. Yeah, fantastic. Yes. Becca had the foresight, though, because uh, we did have a photographer there. Yeah. 
Uh, she had the foresight to be like, hey, do you want to take off a life vest before you do this? And I said, that's a, that's a good idea. Let's, let's do that. So I dropped to a knee, had some intimate conversation with her, some kissing, um, some yeses. And that was that's how it went down, man. Dude, it's such an epic story because let me just paint the perspective of those of us who are on the rooftop. So there's like, you know, all of Brian's family, friends, all of Becca's family and friends, we're all on the rooftop because we're we're going to be there for her surprise engagement party after you guys get off the boat and come on upstairs and then we're going to party the rest of the day. All tested for COVID because Brian runs a COVID testing company, all responsibly done. It was beautifully like organized. Anyway, we see your boat like coming around lower Manhattan and moving up towards the Williamsburg Bridge. Like we know like that this thing is about to happen. And all of a sudden you stall out like right before going under the bridge. And then we see these two Coast Guard boats flanking you and there's four fire trucks that are barreling down the street right in front of your apartment that go and dock you know, in front of where you guys are are basically parked. And we're like, holy shit, we're all speculating. We can't reach you. Someone's trying to call you on the phone. It's going straight to voicemail. So we're like, did Brian drop the ring in the ocean or the, in, the, in the river? Did someone fall over? Like, is there a fire in the boat? We had no idea what was going on. It was just a crazy, chaotic moment for all of us. To hear you tell the story, man, like when you guys came up the staircase and, you know, she was beaming you were beaming. There was this huge celebration. You could have just as easily looked at that situation and been like, this guy blew the surprise. There was the Coast Guard. I've spent weeks, plan- months planning this thing. It didn't go down the right way. Like You could just as easily have looked at that as this was all fucked up. And instead, you're kind of like, we've got a story for the ages. Like, What allowed you to embrace that perspective? Well, first of all, all of our listeners should know that we got all of this on videotape. You did. <laughs> Because I had a friend suggest that that I do more than just photos. I do a recording to catch those like special in between moments, and this was a special in between moment. So, so we have all this on tape, and so Dominic, and I'm, I say that because your question is one. I, I I didn't. If somebody posed this as a question to me, how would you react in this situation? Like I have how I think I would react, and then I have the version of me that reflects on how I actually reacted. <laughs> But now I have the video to see how I actually, <laughs> like in real life, yeah. like did react. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm, I'm happy to say that both my reflection and the, and the tape record the same thing. We've been doing, as you know, I've been doing a lot of Michael Singer work. Yep. And for those that, that haven't read anything related to Michael Singer, he's written a couple of New York Times bestselling books, uh, The Untethered Soul and Living a Life of Surrender is actually an audio book. And, and then The Surrender Experiment is his other big book that people like. Other big book, right. Exactly. And, and if there's one, one way to sum it up, it's that the world unfolds in front of us. It has nothing to do with us. It's been here for 3.8 billion years. 13.8 billion years. Or 13, 13. <laughs> At that number, it doesn't Just matter. Just it off an extra 10 bill. bill. Yeah. <laughs> Just drop the 10 bill. It's been here a long time. And the fun and the joy in the life, and I've seen this in my life over the past, my, my five-year journey in this inner work, is let it unfold, let it happen, and because it's going to take you to magical places, right? And so when this happened, like all of that work kicked in. I didn't feel any anger. I mean, I, was, I started laughing immediately because I was like, like this, is, this is ridiculous. Like I, I didn't create the engine. I'm not in charge of, of making it run. Like I don't run this company. Like thank God the fire department's here. Cause what if it was scarier? And also like we're safe. And I have my fiance here who feels special cause this stuff has been planned and that's it. Like, yeah, okay. So he blew, so he blew the surprise, like big freaking deal. Yeah. You know, so that, that my, that was, that was my immediate reaction was just like, here we are, this is happening and let's embrace it. And it's such a cooler story. Like if had it gone down without a hitch, then, you know, then it's a romantic, you proposed on a boat kind of thing. Now that the engine blows out, your surprise was blown. The Coast Guard showed up and had to flank you and take you back to shore. Like, that's a story you will be telling until you die. You know what I mean? Like, that's going to be a part of, like, the Stacey family legacy. It's, it, I mean, it's, it's a beautiful thing. And the fact that you were able to embrace that and its magic and its silliness and its ridiculousness in the moment um, was really cool. With my partner. Because I probably would have, had, would have been influenced to react differently. If she was really upset yeah, or how she would have been. And man, she was laughing right along with me and we had smiles on our face. We literally looked at each other at the end of that night after all that went down, after hanging out with our friends and family and our faces were hurting because we were, we were just smiling all day long. 
And so having a partner that can roll with life like that, that feels so, so good. I mean, you've hit this beautiful crescendo in your life, right? And obviously this is a temporary place until, you know, the, the next thing happens. But like, this has been a long time coming for you, man. Like things are really rocking and rolling for you right now in your love life, in your business and, you know, a number of other spaces. I, I know you just actually, I'll hold off on, on another big life movement that you and Becca just made that we'll, we'll talk about later, but you've hit this crescendo. And if we're to rewind tape one year ago today, you were probably at the lowest point of your life that I've known you one year ago, exactly one year ago. And I think the saying of the darkest hour is before dawn, right? Something like that. And what that means is, is right before the sun starts to shine, it's as dark and it's bleak outside as it could possibly be. And that's a metaphor for life. Where were you one year ago right now? Like really paint the picture as detailed as you can remember it. And we'll take it from there. Yeah, a, a year ago. And it'd be an interesting experiment to go back to the podcast that we were recording right around this time. I had just officially legally closed down my first business. I put everything I had into that business. And so I was in a really rough financial place. Yeah. You drained everything to, to invest in that business. Like you went all yeah. in on yeah. Beam. Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't, didn't pay myself for two and a half years, like invested all the money in the business. And uh, that's a whole other topic to talk about for entrepreneurs starting a business, <laughs> some do's and don'ts. But that's where I was at. And I didn't know what was next. It's not like I didn't have a job. I wasn't even looking for a job because I wanted to do something on, on my own still. It was the beginning of the pandemic. Becca and I had just left the city. I felt stuck is the best word. I felt stuck financially. I felt stuck like what I was going to do next with like my purpose. And I just felt really, really low. It was in a conversation with Becca that I came to the realization that I felt like a failure. And my identity of, of all of these things that I've tried, and, and I had all of the evidence that I, Brian, was a failure. Yeah, what were those things, man? Yeah, I mean, and, and going back chronologically, like my business had failed. I had put everything I had into it. I had a bunch of failed relationships prior to that. I had wanted to get into the FBI. I didn't get into the FBI. I'd wanted to play college baseball and like I kind of made the team and then like didn't. I ran for student body president at Iowa and came in second place, right? Like I had all of this evidence going back to grade school. Like that's just in a few years there. But going back to grade school, I had all of these stories about like coming in second place or areas of failure in my life. And the realization that came to me when I was having the conversation with Becca is that I'm afraid to start anything else because if I do nothing, if I don't start anything and I just kind of like meander or drift as we might call it, then I can't fail. Yeah. Like there's no more failure and I can't handle another failure. And I, that's why I was so stuck. And that's why I couldn't, I couldn't move. I couldn't find like quote purpose or, or like figure out what was the next thing, the next step that I wanted to take. Yeah, man. I, I remember you laying it out like that for the first time in our mastermind group, right? It was, we, we just kicked off the, the great man mastermind about a year ago in March, March of 2020. And it was a Thursday night call where like you shared this and I knew that you know, shutting down Beam because I'd seen the like, I'd seen the origin of Beam. I saw it like start from kind of a joke to this is a business to you going all in and investing everything and then raising money, having some successes, winning you know entrepreneurial contests and getting funding for it. To then the shutting down of it in a really disappointing way for for you because it had so much potential and seeing the toll that took on you. And then when you brought it to our group. And you said in those words, I, I can still feel it, man. It was like, because you were emotional when you were telling it the first time. It was like, I feel like a failure, you know, like this identity. And when you just went through the chronology of like, even from grade school to college to, you know, early professional career, I mean, you're talking about 15, 20 years of evidence that you put the ball on the five yard line and that like the end zone had eluded you, you know? And I could see that seeping in into that, like, oh, this is maybe just like who I am. And the rest of us, it was a beautiful time for us to shake the shit out of you, <laughs> like to shake your shit up and to be like, dude, don't buy into that story. That is not who you are. Like you are not a failure. Here's all the evidence that you're a legend in our eyes. Look at how every room that you step into, you make better. 
Look at the impact you have on every other guy's life, like when you speak. And then every guy had a chance to come in and share the impact you've had on them and me, you know, like, look what you've done with this podcast. Look what you did with the discerning dick, you know, all the stuff that if you didn't have that group of guys, there's probably an opportunity for you to actually believe that bullshit story. Oh, yeah. And, and so the, the group of guys, a partner that I can have these conversations with, Dominic, that was a big one to just to reveal to my partner that I felt like a failure. Like all the stories were going through my head. I'm like, if I tell her this, like, is she still going to want to be with me? Like, is she going to feel protected? Is she, is she going to feel like I can actually provide for our relationship and maybe even our future family? But the fact that I could have that conversation, that we could come to some sort of insight and move in it together, like that's why we're engaged today. That's one, one reason that we're engaged today because I have a partner that I can bring. I don't have to hide. And that's the biggest thing, man, is like is we've talked a lot on this podcast about our, our private life and our public life. And we align ourselves like through becoming the great man to align those two things. But I still had like whether it was some eating stuff or whether it was some um, financial stuff, something really dark stuff. And the feeling like a failure was one of those dark things. Right on. And so you're at this point feeling like a failure. You and Becca had left the city, you moved in with her parents for a few months, which was beautiful. And also like, it's not your own place, right? And, and so you're living kind of in someone else's home for, I think it was like two or three months or something like that. And you didn't have a clear next step. So like, what was going on in your world where you don't know what's next? You feel like a failure. There's no clear way out. Like what, what was that period of your time like last year? I, I don't want to go back there. I, uh, <laughs> I, I kind of, I kind of want to leave, leave that I'm word. Push back there. Get back there. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. You know, I had a friend reach out to me and he said, hey, Brian, you know that thing that you did with sexual health? Could you do that for coronavirus? Could you make it really easy for me and my company to like, get tested and know if somebody has been tested recently and what the results are? And I contemplated that and said, huh, I said, gosh, I, I know all the people. Like I know I know who to reach out to, to to get this thing off the ground pretty quickly. So I reached out to a friend of mine who runs a development shop, like technology development shop. I reached out to a couple of people in the industry. I uh, hadn't seen anything yet at that point that was quite like that. And I said, you know what? I have literally no money to invest in this. <laughs> um, how am I going to get this started if I want to get it started? The development shop and I agreed on a, on a co-founder relationship. They were going to put all the sweat equity into to building it. I was going to put put it into building the business. And I think the big difference, Dominic, in, in like where I was at at that point is I wasn't trying to change the world. I was just trying to do something that I really enjoyed with cool people and make money. And so that was a big, important piece of all of this because I was in a place that like I needed to make money now. And as you know, most businesses don't make a, a lot of money to begin with. And I unfortunately just didn't have that kind of runway. And so that was the the lowest point is the one that you just talked about when I described myself as a failure to that mastermind of guys. And then there was a spark at that point where I felt so stuck as a spark and huh, like, wouldn't that be interesting to go build something like that? What do I really want out of it? Now, when I was in that time of, let's call it the stuckness, there was also a lot of like soul searching and reflection and, and space and so going into this business, what I realized is like, I want to work with people that I really enjoy working with. I want to build something that's really cool and I need some control to do that. Did that all come clear to you during that stuck period? Yes. And how long were you in that stuck period? I was there when I think about that bottom, I was there for six months and there was some time leading down to the bottom also. <laughs> and that spark that I'm talking about, Dominic, I can remember being at Becca's parents feeling this when I started to have the idea a few conversations, I felt electricity running through my spine. Hmm. I could just feel it talking to Becca. And like when you're stuck, when I was stuck and I just felt like nothing was quite working and I didn't know what I wanted to do, I, I just I felt a deadening. There just wasn't a lot of energy there. But man, it, the sign was as clear as the sun in my face when I felt that. And all I did at that point was follow that. Yep. I said, let me just follow this until it's, if, and if it goes away, we all have ideas, right? We all have, oh, this is a cool idea. This here's a million dollar idea. We all have ideas that probably percolate in our mind every single day. But this one, I felt the electricity and I decided to follow it. Yeah. And I told myself that if this doesn't feel right at some point in this journey, I will shut it down and I will go get a job. Yep. And I told Becca that too. Yep. 
But man, like feeling that electricity that I knew I was coming out of that depressive sort of stuck space. It takes massive cojones to sit in six months of stuck. You weren't self-loathing. There's a difference to the kind of stuck that you're talking about. There's two types of stuck, I would say. There's the kind of stuck that you're beating yourself up. You don't have a plan. And then there's not an intention for that stuckness. Your intention for that stuckness was to get clear. And you were like to yourself, I am not going to prematurely jump into something, a lesser path, dive into a lesser goal, dive into you know anything, That's right. right? Like you were like, I am waiting for that electricity. And it took a lot longer than most people on this planet would have patience for. Certainly me. I don't know. I don't know if I could have done that, man. I don't know if I could have sat for six months. There would probably been something in me that would have jumped way sooner, but you sat in it. And what was it? Like, where did this confidence come from? It maybe didn't feel like confidence at the time, but it, it sure sounds confident and courageous to sit there for six months to wait for that level of electricity and that messaging. This is a super easy answer because I knew what the other path was like. I spent 13 years in corporate and I thought about going back to that because I was making good money and I could get stable and everything else. I knew exactly what that path felt like. And my dad asked me that question, like, why don't you just go back to your old job? And I was like, the answer was very clear. It's, it's because that will kill me. Oh. Like, I know that if I go down that path, like I know what that's going to give me and that will absolutely kill me. I don't know if it would physically kill me or kill my spirit or maybe both even. But that's why. That's that's one of the reasons I was able to to just sit in it and wait. I didn't think I was going to be waiting that long. Like looking back on it, six months seems like a long time. But when you're doing it day by day, the, the plan isn't, okay, I'm going to give myself six months. Yep. That's amazing. So you launched Vahila when? I launched Vahila in it was about May 1st. May 1st, 2020. And Vahila provides... We created a platform. What we noticed is uh, there are big groups trying to do coronavirus testing about every week, and they were trying to do it in spreadsheets. And so we said, okay, cool. I think that we can create a platform that help people define their protocol, which means testing how long, types, temperatures, health symptom surveys. So all these things that go into a protocol, and then we can tell them who within their group has followed that protocol and therefore should be able to come on set or into the company. So we, we help manage that entire process for events and for, for companies. So check this out. April 30th, there's no business. May 1st, you launch this business and we're recording this on April 8th, 2021. And who are some of your clients? Oh man, we got the BBC, we got HBO, we got Netflix, we've got Chobani, we've got Gosh, I'm forgetting. Dancing all. with the Stars, The Weakest Dancing Link. Dancing with the Stars, <laughs> Weakest Link. Right, 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 right. Less than one year later, you've got these massive clients. The really cool thing about starting a second business in a similar space is you can use all those lessons immediately. And I had all of these lessons from my first company. One of them is I didn't pay myself yeah. in my first company. And I knew I couldn't pay myself because the company didn't have any money, right, uh, when, when we started this one. And so I knew I was going to have a few months of that. And so it took us about three months to build out the platform uh, prior to launching it with some of these clients. And then it got to a point where we had made a pretty good amount of money. So I had started paying myself. I started paying my partners. These are the things I make. Like we couldn't plan the Coast Guard and we can't plan the synchronicity of all of these events happening in the order and the proximity with which they happened. What a total anomaly that is, man. Because if you think about how long it takes for businesses, startup businesses, tech businesses to like turn a profit and you're not even a year into this business, you have all these marquee clients, you know, you've paid the, the other contractors and employees that you've hired. And you and Becca have another exciting announcement that we have not yet shared with our audience too. Exciting for you, sad for me, but what, what's something that's just going down now between you guys? We are moving out of New York City. Uh, we are moving to Philadelphia. Yeah, there it is. There it is. Um, Breaking my heart. Yeah, Becca's, Becca's, <laughs> Becca's got family in Philadelphia and we weren't, we weren't quite ready to leave a city yet and wanted to be in like a nice walkable city. Uh, and quite frankly, man, New York's really expensive. And so when we looked at firstly, like my financial situation and we wanted to buy. And so we looked at those three areas of like, what's it like to buy in Philly? Um, she's got family there. We want to be in a city and it's not too far from New York. 
again, I'll go back to that feeling I had when we first started talking about this business, that electricity, and to just follow like where that electricity is at. Like we contemplated being nomadic for two months at a time in different locations. We contemplated going to San Francisco. We contemplated staying in New York, maybe doing Miami for a year or two, going to Austin, Texas, where a lot of our friends are at now. And none of that felt like electricity. And this one felt aligned. It felt like electricity. And so this is how I'm living my life now. And I got to say, it's really exciting because Philadelphia was not in the cards. When I looked at my checklist of thing, like things I wanted, like I wanted mountains, I wanted water, I wanted like, like none of that is in Philadelphia. But when we started contemplating this idea for us, I felt that electricity. Yeah. First of all, congratulations, man. I'm, of course, I'm going to be you know sad slash devastated that you're leaving the proximity and we will continue our relationship virtually, no doubt. And of course, I'm going to be jumping on that Acela and getting down there to see you guys. But again, like if you look at where you were a year ago to now having a thriving business, having just gotten engaged, having just purchased a home, your first home, I mean, all in one year's time. And this was right before like the dawn was your darkest hour. And I think it's really important for our listeners just because this last year has been fucking rough on so many of us, all of us in varying degrees or forms, it's been rough. I just listen to the way that you make your decisions now where you're talking about like, oh, we were thinking about doing nomadic stuff, two months here, two months there, but that didn't feel electric, but Philadelphia did. And I sat in the stuckness for six months until I found that electricity and I didn't know where the path was leading, but I just felt that and I trusted that and therefore I was going to go. And I look at the contrast of that to some of the stories you've shared with me pre-inner work, Brian, you know, like pre-five years ago where many of those decisions were made from the head, you know, like whether it was like your real estate license or other parts of, you know, these kinds of things that got you wound up in so many different places that you had to unwind over time. Maybe if we're just going to continue our reverse chronology, like rewind tape to where you were five years ago to pre-inner work, Brian, and like, who is that guy, man? <laughs> oh man, who, who was that guy? Well, I, th I think one reflection to bring us back to that point is, as we talked about, uh, I just got engaged and posted that on social media. And I've had a lot of people reach out to me, either either through Instagram or even text message that I haven't heard from in years. And they have a theme, like each one of those messages has a theme, even if it's said in different ways. And it's, wow, I never thought I'd see the day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a pretty good way. And, and, and there, there's almost like, especially for those that are like in a relationship, it's almost like they've been waiting. They've been waiting for like, like me to come along. <laughs> I can kind of get to a point. But I, I think that that's, that's fair because I was a very, very different person even five years ago. When you say uh, making decisions from the head, all 100%. Like I didn't, I didn't know that there was another way to make decisions. Yeah. So everything was a calculation. I put who the types of people I wanted to date on a spreadsheet. Yeah, like, right. And the different attributes, must-haves and not must-haves, right? That was the advice that I got to do that. And so I did it and it made a whole lot of sense. And because it made sense, it felt good. Right. <laughs> and dude, it's hard. This, I want to hit this point. Like for people that are, let's say, analytically minded, that's okay. But understanding that's only half the deck. It's only half the ball game. I was playing with half a deck for so, so long. And it caused me to do things that hurt relationships that didn't allow me to thrive in business that still felt good in the moment because it made sense. And so this is the biggest difference between the younger version of Brian and this one is that I can take a pause. I can sit in that space. I can feel into it and then make a decision based on that. And that's it. I mean, what you say about playing with half a deck rings so true. And, and when you're like, you know, this makes sense, right? That like logical thing. There's a time and a place for makes sense. You know what I mean? But to live your life through the lens of, well, that makes sense. Like to live your life logically all the time. Like how boring is that? You know what I mean? Like who wants to live? The reason why we love music, music doesn't make sense. Like music is inspiring. Movies, you don't love movies that make sense. You love movies and TV shows that are, adventurous, mysterious, inspiring, have conflict. Why do I want my life to make sense? It's boring. And Jim Carrey is the guy who says, what is it? We make so many of our decisions based on fear masquerading as practicality. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, well, it's practical. I'm doing what's logical. Like 
when your business of Beam shuts down, the practical thing to do, the logical thing to do is to go back to your corporate career because that makes sense. And I'm not saying there's not a time or a place to make decisions that make sense. I'm saying if that's the only hammer you are swinging, then everything, you know, uh, looks like the make sense nail. And it, I don't know if that even analogy even works, but you know what I'm trying to say here. I got you. <laughs> okay. I got you. <laughs> so over the past two months, I've had a lot of conversations with guys, whether it's a guy cutting my hair or helping us with the tables for the party upstairs. And they inevitably ask, like, oh, what's going on? And I talk to them about the engagement. And then they start to reflect on their own experience. And like, oh, yeah, you know, I've been living with my girlfriend for like two years. It's probably time. She's going to get upset if I don't. Like, da, da, da. And like, man, my heart aches for them because they are in that logical place where it isn't logical. Like there is no checklist of am I with the person long enough? Does she have enough? Whatever, you know, whatever's on your checklist. And I felt for those guys. And every single time I was like, dude, like, like, that's cool. I get it. Like you've been there for a while. But like, why are you in this relationship, period? Where are you at right now? Like what, like, what excites you about this or doesn't excite you about this? For Becca and I, you know, it's, it's fun to sit here and talk of a few days after an engagement because it's, like a, it's a really high point. But we went through stuff like in the, the conversation of feeling a failure was just one of those. And we had a lot of those. And the difference is I'm able to navigate that now because of the inner work, because I have emotional fluency. I have emotional intelligence, whereas I could see in these guys, they don't, they don't, they can't even see that half of the map. And so what they're trying to do is use the only tools that they have to say like, well, I've been here for two years. She wants to get married. I should, because that's what my parents told me. Like, therefore I'm going to do it. And oh my gosh, like talk about the wrong reason to go about, to go about doing something. Those are the inputs that are leading to presumably a decision that could last the next 60 years of your life. Or if those are your inputs, probably not going to last 60 years of your life. Or if they do, it's going to be an unfulfilling 60 years of your life. And I see so many guys who only make decisions from their heads spend years, years thinking about, do I get married or not? Do I love this person or not? Do I start this business or not? Do I go for the next job or not? Do I switch industries or not? It's like, and they just keep playing out these simulations in their head because it's a weak decision-making process versus you were unequivocally clear, electricity, we're moving to Philly. Electricity, I'm starting this business. Correct me if I'm wrong, Brad, but you're not saying, I know it's the right decision that's going to lead to the perfect outcomes. It's just that I know it's the next right action. That's it. That, that's exactly it. I can't tell you what's going to happen. I believe that Beck and I will be together forever. I don't know that for sure. But it feels, and we agreed on this going into it, it feels like we're both running into this full steam and that feels phenomenal. So that exactly what you're saying, that's that's true. It's like, I don't know what's going to happen in 20 years, but I do know what I'm feeling right now. And my trust is that if I continue to follow that energy, that good things are going to happen. And that's a trust. You want to talk about like, like we often talk about faith as a religious based thing, Right. And faith is trusting that if I follow that instinct, if I follow that electricity in all aspects of my life, then the faith is that life is going to be more exciting and wilder than I could have been possibly imagined, a la Coast Guard. Right? Couldn't have planned that. But follow the energy. Here we are. Hey, how awesome is our boy, Brian? <laughs> He's the best, isn't he? Well, this is your chance to let him know what this episode meant to you. Whether his story provides you some level of hope, some inspiration, maybe you're dealing with some sort of adversity right now that his story shined a light on for you to make it easier, then I will ask you to let him know in one of two ways. Come over to the Great Man Within Facebook group and tag Brian in a post, let him know what you're feeling, or leave a rating on Apple Podcasts pointing to this episode, thanking Brian in a public way. These are the two ways that you'll let him know that this episode made a difference for you in turning your adversity into triumph.